I thought it was 34 people. And we were about Baker's dozen, 18 or something. Great, okay. Um, do, should we, you want to ask for a Dhamma talk? Might as well do it formally. Can do. For everyone. So we have a formal way of requesting a Dhamma talk as well. Oh, we, whoop, whoop, whoop. we have a volunteer. And so Jane's going to do that. This is a very high church, Jane. Namo tasa pakawato arahato sama sampo tasa. Namo tasa pakawato arahato sama sampo tasa. Namo tasa pakawato arahato sama sampo tasa. Uttang dhammang sankang masami. So it's nice to be with real human beings rather than digital human beings. Nice to be with digital human beings too. <laughs> So it's okay. It's a nice mixture. <clears throat> I think this example of listening to the lawnmower is quite, quite, quite a nice, interesting example, isn't it? So I was listening later on, I was listening to the cardinal and the lawnmower. And we don't, we don't get cardinals in Perth, strange. Here you get lots of them. Can't figure that out. Anyway, not a problem. Um, but so the cardinal sound has a certain aesthetic appeal to me. And the lawnmower has this sort of urban small engine sound, which is it's different. And uh, you could see how if I just prefer cardinal sounds, I'm finished in this life. Um, and yet I need, I need to have preferences in my life because um, if I don't have wise preferences, then where's the structure of my life? There has to be some structure. Uh, so when, when we're talking about meditation, we're not obviously talking about uh, our, our, our social reality in that sense, our, our social commitments. So for example, I might say that awareness allows all things, allows the arising of all things and allows the finish of all things. All things can come and go within awareness. But that's not some kind of social philosophy where I accept everything. For, so for a social philosophy, we have the five precepts, we have generosity, those general guidelines. So if, if someone were to come to a tisa in a monastery, and now that smoking marijuana is legal in Ontario or Canada, I've got no problem with that. But if they came and said, well, my practice is, is I'm a Rasta and uh, I do ganja, right? That's my religious practice. And, and so I do it for that. And so I think they'll do it here with you. I say, no, you can't do that because that's not our social agreement. You can have your, you know, you can away, live the way your life is, but, you know, we have our boundaries. We all agree upon the boundaries and no, you can't do that. So there is, there are, there are things which are unacceptable. So it's always important to, you know, differentiate between the social philosophies and social, the way we relate as social beings, the issues of social justice and environmental issues and so on. Those are very, very important. 
but when I when I come to this kind of a meeting, that's not what I'm referring to. I'm always, ref unless I get into those topics, I'm referring to the stream of consciousness and how we can find peace within that. And then if we have a, a taste for peace, then we can bring that back into the areas of social responsibility which we struggle with. And then we can join grandmothers united or whatever you call yourselves or that kind of we can make efforts towards the environment and all the rest of it and we do and and take care of our grandkids and and brothers and sisters so what i'm talking about and and buddhism always talks in these two ways one way it talks about the sense of individuality and the person and the sense of a person in social contexts and then it talks about stream of consciousness where it doesn't use the word personality it uses words like aggregates sense experience sankaras khandas dependent origination anicca dukkha anatta you know all of that language is about stream of consciousness and it's it's very important to remember those those two um, and there's always so many issues going on that that i don't think a buddhist monk's work is like solving the issues of contemporary society like buddhism doesn't really take a position on things it just says well there are consequences so like i was saying in the was that that must have been the must have been beta's group i was saying that you know like is 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 it morally just is it ever morally justifiable to 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 kill. And that's not really a Buddhist question. The Buddhist question is, what's the result of killing? And the results are not good. Not good at all for anyone. So I, I was citing the example of uh, a conscript in the Russian army in the Ukraine, a mercenary in the Russian army, and a defender uh, in the Ukrainian army. They're all, their all, minds are all going to be a mess after this war. No one gets away with it. So that's really the question. And, and whatever society says that this is um, like someone might be praised as a hero of the Ukrainian resistance. But after the war, they're going to go back to their family. They're going to have PTSD. Wife and kids are going to have to deal with it. You're not the same that you were before dad and, and the whole nine yards. So that's really what, what, what Buddhism points to more in terms of its moral philosophy is what's the consequence of doing what we do now the 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 buddhism isn't just a moral philosophy the, the buddha realizes something transcendent and it's not just a a uh, like a psychology psychological methodology although that's very very good and those are necessary necessary but the buddha's realization is some possibility of deep peace within the turmoil of life within the complexities of life and and touching that it's very subtle and it's not something that you touch with just blind willpower and i think all of us who started meditation i i know i did i just used blind willpower you know i'm going to meditate and get enlightened good luck uh and all the teachers are just chuckle yeah the buddha ajahn, ajahn chah would say yeah that you know the buddha took many lifetimes plus at least seven years plus he had to borrow me and you're going to do it tomorrow <laughs> good luck mate but though those those kind of willful acts of meditation i think all of us go through that where we really try which is not bad you know it has a good intention behind it and and through that i should think misdirection of effort we learn what right effort is and it becomes i think for all of us more and more subtle so your early days of meditation mine were always like these complex meditations and these constructs which i would try to do and to kind of manipulate the mind or get some kind of a result and then i tired of that and then my teacher would te keep talking about letting go what do you mean letting go and then easy word and then someone would say letting be and and that kind of language of of beginning to know the way things are from a sense of acceptance was there all the time for me but it took a while for my 
willful, the willful part of my being to kind of come to the conclusion that willpower itself is not going to work. So what is wisdom? What is letting go? What is non-attachment? Different words that we use. Um, so I, I, in this medit the meditation this morning, I'm just playing around with focus and openness. Focus and openness. Now you, you can focus skillfully or you can focus unskillfully. So I could, I could focus on the breath with a desire to get rid of thought. That wouldn't give a good result. I could focus on the breath with a desire to attain to some experience I had maybe last year in a retreat, some peaceful experience. Both of those would be involving desire. The desire to get rid of, get rid of thought, and the desire to become. And that seems to be the root of the problem, actually, that the problem of suffering is attached to desire. So then, you know, th through that kind of struggle, we start to have this more, for me, interesting language. Well, what is desirelessness? You know, that's not a word we use much in culture. Fulfill your desires, you know, your, your, your whatever. But then you put in different kind of language, desirelessness. Now, that affects the mind in a completely different way. How does it affect it? Well, you can't get that. Can, can you get desirelessness? Because you're trying to get desirelessness, you're already sort of doesn't compute. But if you, if you contemplate a word like that, and this is the, you know, how I like to use language for contemplation, not, not for belief or dogma. So if I use a word like that, desirelessness, then I have to return to the attitude that I'm operating from right now. What, what, what's, what's the attitude? And that can be very, very helpful. So then I, I, I maybe I'm watching the breath and I pop in desirelessness. Pop that in. That is, creates a possibility of then the breath being a vehicle for awakening. Rather than the breath being a vehicle for getting rid of thought or becoming, you know, getting some fabulous mind state that I had or I read about. So attitude, maybe that's what we're more cultivating is an attitude of, of attention or awareness rather than an experience. So listening to the lawnmower, you could say, I, and if, I, I, if I say to just listen, let the sound come to you. Now, to me, if I do that, it's more like a, a posture or an attitude, it's not really like an experience. You see what I mean? You could say it's the experience of being awakened and you could use that kind of language, but it's different than like when I sit by Pike Lake and the mosquitoes are not biting, which is not now, <laughs> but down the road, it's very, very silent. It's very, very silent, very, very peaceful. But that's the piece of, of Space, water, silence, nature. Uh, but the piece that I'm talking about is the piece that is not contingent. And, and so the exercises I suggest are exercises of attitude or awakening to any, anything, anything that comes up. So as I always say, begin simple, begin with sound, begin with just bodily feeling something that isn't highly negative or highly positive. So the thing about watching or using the breath to sustain the awake mind, on, on the whole, it's neutral. You know, it's neither exciting nor, I mean, if you stop breathing, it'll get exciting, yeah. But <laughs> and, you know, hopefully. Um, so it's, it's very neutral. So actually to pay attention to it, you, 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 um, it, it doesn't really fulfill your desires. Thing is, then it gets boring. Your mind starts to think about Pavlovas or whatever you like to think about. So the desire mind isn't satisfied by the object of awareness. So the desire mind then creates restlessness. You know, and, and where does it go? It goes into fantasies or into worries or into plans or, or, or fidgeting. And so by observing something like the breath from desirelessness, Desire is frustrated. 
but desire will come up. It'll come up like if you feel restless, you look at the clock, oh God, it's only, it's only a quarter of an hour and there's a half hour left. And you feel, oh, I'm not getting anywhere, all of that. That's desire. That's desire coming up. I want something or, or, or it's boring or I'm not getting anywhere. And in a culture where we absorb a lot into sense experience through various media forms, it's really hard, really, really hard to, to do nothing. And, and not be drawn into the excitement of our, of our uh, media. It's really quite, it's quite tough to do. So we plunk ourselves down here and, and, and we sit and we watch. And you, you may feel tired, like you just had lunch and your heads are falling off or you should have had more coffee or you feel hot. And so it's not such a fun experience necessarily. But what you're doing is you, by sustaining awareness on the way the experience is, rather than absorbing into an experience which is exciting or interesting, you're sustaining the awake mind. Even if you fall asleep a bit or you don't like it, you're sustaining the awake mind. And that has results which are not so much experiential, but they become the background of experience, which is silence. And the more you can do that, the more you intuit that in each in any given experience, there's always that silent space of knowing, which is within or without or around or in. There's no real spatial way to describe it. That's what you really want to get to, I think. Not, not so much an experience, but remembering that space. And then the more you can go into places of quietness, like your morning meditation or a retreat or whatever, you... you you reinforce that insight that this is this is really the path. So when when I listen to the sound of the lawnmower or the cardinal, whatever, I just listen, and the mind is awake and present and knowing. And I say, that's the path. That's it. I'm home. This is home. And I and I keep reinforcing that uh, in a way which is very positive. It's a kind of affirmation. It's not an ego affirmation. I've got it because that, well, that's pathetic. <laughs> and I've done that enough. So it's not a matter of getting it. It's more, oh, yeah, yeah, this is it. Oh, yeah, remembering. It's more a remembering thing. And if you can do that, like in a morning meditation or whenever you can, and you can learn to sustain that for half an hour, that kind of vibrant, silent, knowing, uh, we call it sometimes emptiness, but it's full. It's a lot of paradox in the language. If you can really sustain that for long periods of time, then that begins to be the echo in ordinary life. In, in, if you go to KJP or... <laughs> you won't know KJP. You, you, you want to know about it, actually. Uh, or Home Depot or, or uh, Lee Valley. These are the places that, that I go to. It's a local joke. But then, like, you walk into some place, like, which is like an airport. I, I used to do a lot of airport practice before COVID. So then the, the airport has a, has a vibe to it, especially when I was, I was in Florida in December in Miami airport. It's not a happy vibe. You know, it's really chaotic and big lineups and people don't know where's the vax line or what do you do and where's the mass. It's quite, quite chaotic. And then, but then you can, you can register chaos feels this way. And if you have enough trust and, and, and experience of doing this, you know, you do it a million times a day kind of thing. Chaos feels this way. Then you touch the silence, which is in the midst of chaos. It has to be. So the, the most difficult really are the, the, the emotional world because the emotional world is, it's emotional. <laughs> and the emotional world is messy and it, it's not logical and it just does stuff to you, it creates perceptions and all kinds of things which aren't rational and idealistic. 
just the way it is. It's messy. Um, so I was saying on that talk with Beta, an interesting idea. Like, can you can you understand this? Like, can you feel anger but not be angry? Possible, yeah. Can you fully feel anger and not be angry? And that's interesting, isn't it? Because it's not it's not like rejecting anger. Oh, my practice is terrible. I got so angry at the Home Depot lineup. And, oh, it's terrible, terrible. But actually, that's just another <laughs> ego thing you put on yourself. But can I can I be angry? No, I'm not asking to be angry. <laughs> but should anger be triggered, which it does, because it's natural, because of whatever, it gets triggered. Can I be? Can I fully feel anger and not be angry? An interesting thought, and you can, if you understand that, not be angry. So then someone asked me in that in that talk, well, what about joy? Can you? You mean I can't be joyful? No, that's not it. Like, if joy arises, can you fully feel joy, and not go into thought, which is not joy? Enjoy, you know, oh yeah, I'll take a selfie and this is great. And I'll come back here next year or, well, we should do this again. <laughs> that's not joy. That's just thought, thought. But to actually like connect to, to, to joy, if, it, if it's, that's what's manifested, to believe, feel a joy. What does that do? What does that do for consciousness? Well, it uplifts it, but also then the joy doesn't go to excitement. It stays in the silence. It stays in the silence. Doubt, worry, all these you know different different moods of the mind that we all experience. They're, they're they're very powerful, and I think the meditator's problem is that we we feel that somehow we are wrong to feel angry or fearful that our practice isn't on, but that's another addition to the emotion that's there. It's something extra that we're adding to it. But what is it like before we add that extra bit? What is it like to feel whatever? Now, it's hard. I, su I suggest using, using sense objects. So like, like the color blue on that beautiful painting. And then, or purple or whatever you want to call it. So then I look at that color. And I allow the color to be what it is without defining it as purple or blue or so it doesn't matter if I'm colorblind even. And I just abide as witness to the color. Now, if I do that without comment, I touch the silence. Right? If I make a comment or I think, well, what does he mean by the silence? Where's the silence? <laughs> then I'm not really paying attention to the color. I'm paying attention to some thought processes. So paying attention, that's simple enough. But then it's not about the color, it's about the silence. It's the silence of knowing and witnessing. And if I do that a lot in my meditation, I get used to that, then the emotional life I'll be able to deal with much better. So then it'll be, oh, this is resentment. And what's that like? But then there's the silence. So it's fully feeling resentment, but not being resentful. Or then there's the judgment after the resentment. Oh, I shouldn't be resentful. I should have more metta. You know, what does that feel like? So at some point, you have to break the cycle of self-thinking. If you just keep in self-thinking, it's hopeless. So maybe I feel like resentment towards someone. And then that's a memory. And then another voice comes up. Oh, you're terrible. You've been resenting that person for at least two years. You should. And at some point, you have to say, yeah, but what's it really like right now? Before I add all that additional thought, what's it really, really like to feel this? And then you feel whatever it is, but you're not it. And, and that exercise, I think, begins with simple sense experience rather than complicated sense experience, because you can, you can explore that. So you can, you can be um, in an airport waiting, waiting for the plane and then the plane is delayed two hours, and you can watch how everyone else is reacting. Oh, God. And then maybe you react, or I've got those people on the other end waiting for me. And then, oh, well, what's it really like? What's this experience really, really like? 
So then you feel the, the confusion of not getting your flight, but you don't become confused. So it's not a rejection of, because sense experience is so varied and so disturbing, you know, we're very sensitive that to deny that would be not, to be not human. It's just some kind of Ottoman that functions through life, but we're very sensitive. So it's not really, I, I would, you know, it's not really the emotional reactions that we have to things. It's the, it's the attachment. And that's a word that I was thinking, what, what, what might be another word for attachment? Because these Buddhist words become cliched, I suppose, or, or maybe not, but, you know, use them all the time and you forget what it means. So I was thinking, what about like engagement, non-engagement? What if I don't engage with the feeling of fear? There's just fear. And what would engagement be? Well, that would be thought. You know, why do I feel this fear and I shouldn't feel this fear and it shouldn't be this way? Why do I feel this resentment? That's an engagement with the object. But if I, what if I don't engage with it? I just know it. So I can do that with the color blue, with the sound of a lawnmower, um, and then maybe with thought. The thought's very quick and very compelling. Um, I can raise a thought up. I really don't like that person. What does that feel like? Now, the thing to do this in our culture is to create spaces and times where we're not distracted. Maybe that's the biggest problem, where we're not distracted by the media that we have and, and the responsibility. We actually create times like this retreat or this day of mindfulness where we're doing nothing. It's really hard to do nothing. Because, you know, I could do this. this is so many interesting things to do. I don't know about you. I mean, I got a bucket list the size of I'll never die. <laughs> but that itself is very, very compelling, but it's not necessarily peaceful. So doing meditation or doing a retreat, it's not really meant to be that interesting and stimulating and exciting. That might be a workshop of weaving. <laughs> Or carpentry or, or art or whatever this is more very neutral and in that neutrality you just kind of be with it be with it and then your mind is no longer going out it's staying home and when it stays home it knows silence and then when it knows silence it begins to really appreciate how nourishing that is yeah and and how interesting silence is more and more of that okay my friends i think we need a cold shower now <laughs> or some stimulation so why don't we do some walking meditation would that work for a while oh yes please Jane <clears throat> survive that <laughs> okay so how about another 45 minutes bell ringers ringers of bells yep so we'll do walking meditation for 45 minutes and then we'll come back and do nodding